Today we're finally going to have a chat, at long last, about airbrushing. Oh, this is going to take a minute. <sighs> Hello. Right, it's finally time to talk about airbrush. I want to try and break this down and keep it as simple as possible, just because there's there's so much to get lost in with airbrushing. It's a really deep art form and you can go so into it and just like really overload your brain box with information. I want to try and cut all of that away. So I'm just going to go through some real simple basics with you, talk about application at its most basic level, the things that I mostly use airbrushing for in my day-to-day -day painting. This is not an advanced video. This is not a video that's gonna teach you how to get Sergio Calvo-like results, as incredible as the guy is. Um, this is gonna be about just getting you confident enough to take that airbrush kit that you've bought and left on a shelf and ignored, and start to try and make some art with it, specifically some miniature painting. So, you're gonna need an airbrush, obviously. This is mine. This is my little friend. Hey, buddy. Uh, this is my Harder and Steenbeck Evolution. It's my main airbrush. It's about 100 quid, so it's not a ridiculously priced airbrush. Um, they used to be quite a bit more than that, if I remember correctly, but they've, they've started to appear at more reasonable prices recently. Um, obviously, other than this, you're going to need a compressor, a hose. Um, you'll want one of those little cleaning cup thingies. You've probably seen those. It's like a jar with a lid on it and uh, a little rest that you can put your airbrush into. Then you're going to want, you know, some thinners, some airbrush cleaner, some paints. Um, we'll talk about a couple of other little bits as we get into the video. But, you know, you've probably got the kit if you're watching this. You probably either, either have the kit or are about to buy the kit, so you've done that research. That's not really what we're here for. Um, the first thing I want to talk about while we're still in this camera view is air pressure. There are um, a lot of very advanced level airbrushing things where you really need to sit there and tweak the th how thinned your paint is versus how much pressure you're running through your airbrush. And there's a lot to it but for your everyday painting um basically for priming and base coating i just run my airbrush at a flat 40 psi chuck wide open which you know for those of you that aren't familiar it means pulled back right like that just literally full blast hold the miniature sort of eight eight to ten inches away and just go for it for basic priming and base coating, you know, just putting one colour on pretty much the entire miniature, that's going to do you. Then when I come into doing more detailed stuff, I drop my PSI down to about 20 and I start to thin my paint a bit more. Now, when we go into down cam today, the stuff that I'm going to show you, all of that is going to be at 20 PSI and you're going to see how thin my paint is because I'm actually going to demonstrate the thinning process. But... I thought it's kind, of, you know, it's it's worth telling you that there are two pressures really that you're going to use most of the time. Um, your your compressor is very easy to read. Most of them, you can get posh ones that have got all sorts of fancy readouts, but most of them are just going to have a barometer style dial on them, and that's going to have a needle. And basically, that needle wants to read forty when you're priming or base coating, and it wants to read twenty when you're trying to do anything a little bit finer. You may then go off of your own volition, get into some more advanced stuff, find yourself playing with other pressures, other dilutions. That's up to you. Today we just want to cover basics. So, now that we know pressures, now that we've got a rough idea of what we need to own, I'm going to go to down cam and I'm going to show you some actual painting, because that's what you come for, isn't it? Actual painting, not listening to me waffle. See you in the down cam. Okay, so as I was saying, to begin with, 40 PSI, and I've just primed the miniature with matte black paint. Uh, I didn't think you needed a video to see that. What I did want to show you, though, is one of my bestest little friends, these little plastic cups. These are little sauce pots. They come with lids, and I get them from Amazon. I use these for mixing all of my paints for airbrushing in. Why, Mr. Shy, is it important to mix paints not in the airbrush but in a separate container well let me tell you loyal viewer it is important because if you get any particles or any crap in your paint you can't see it when it's in the airbrush cup whereas if you mix it separately in a clear container like this anything that is tainting that paint in any way you'll be able to see it 
So you can see me here just going in with this boreal green. Colours don't matter today, it's not about the colours, it's about the method. And I've just added a bunch of airbrush thinner to it and I'm getting it really, really nice and thin, quite transparent. And then I'm pouring it into the airbrush cup. And you can see because I'm pouring it in separately like that, I can kind of check it as it goes in and make sure that the paint is pure and clean. And then at a fairly close distance and I'm still at a high pressure here, I'm still at 40 PSI here. I'm just getting basically some shadows blocked in. This, this boreal green is kind of, um, it's just there to tie the black into the green layers that I'm going to put on top. So this first layer, it doesn't really, you don't really need to be very careful with it, you just kind of blast it on. Um, I'm still aiming obviously for areas that are getting light, the idea being the areas that are not getting any light, like you know the insides of the legs under the crotch, under the area between the backpack and, and the back plate and that kind of thing. Those areas you leave pretty much black because there's no light going into them. Um, and that's sort of part of the, the style of airbrushing, um, you know, smaller miniatures like this. So it's, it's really just a case with this green of just starting to lay foundations for where you want paints to go. Uh, we're coming up now into the next paint, Naga Green, which, th so this is now my mid-tone. So I'm gonna thin this back to buggery again. And you can see, you know, I really do thin these paints a lot, like they're very, very runny. Um, but now I'm going to jump down to 20 PSI because I want to start being a bit more accurate now, a bit more careful. You see me do a quick spot test there because I want to see, this is a new airbrush to me, so I just want to know, you know, how much it blasts at what range. But you can see that basically I'm aiming now deliberately for areas that I want to catch light. So you'll see me sort of turn the model quite a lot to make sure that I've always got the best angle and I'm focusing. Now there, I made a mistake and I've slowed the footage down just for a second to show you that. If you blast too heavily, in that case I was just a bit heavy handed, I hit the trigger a bit too hard and blob, suddenly there's a massive spot of paint on the foot panel there. Just let it dry, see how it looks. If it's fucked, go back to black and then your, you know, your previous colour work it up again to the same point where you're currently working and it will just blend seamlessly. You'll, ne you'll never know that there was a mistake there. That's the really nice thing about airbrush. Everything sort of layers over itself really seamlessly. So if you do make little mistakes like that, don't panic. Don't think that, oh, I'm shit at airbrushing, I'm never gonna get it. Everybody has a twitchy finger every now and again where they, they cock up and they apply too much paint to an area that they didn't mean to apply that much paint to. Just let it dry and then judge it. In this case, when I let this dry, because I've got my paint so thin, it's actually fine. Like it didn't even look bad in the end. So I just left it and carried on. But if it is problematic, just go back a couple of steps. You'll be fine. You'll be absolutely fine. So after we've squirted all that mid-tone in, that's what we're kind of looking at now. And it's starting, you know, we can see that this sort of light play is starting to occur on the piece. But now we want to get some really bright spots in there. This is where our, you know, our main sort of highlights are going to live. So I'm using this pale yellow colour in this case because I want it to be brighter, but I don't want to lose too much saturation in my green. I don't want my green to go really, really washed out. So I mix this kind of bright yellow in instead of white. Um, and then like an idiot, I lose my footage. My footage got corrupted. So you see the finished result here. Um, what I am going to do is show you these couple of still images to show you just how little finger movement there is. This is my airbrush closed, and this is what it looks like when I'm actually applying the paint. You can see I'm barely back on that trigger by a hair, but essentially we just carried on and did the same thing as in the last step. We're just applying more highlights. So now we get into the coolest technique. This is airbrush glazing. This is one of my favorite airbrush techniques. Obviously, it's looking very bright at the moment. It's looking very sort of loud and leery, and we don't want that. That doesn't look natural, it doesn't look cool. So I'm getting some inks here. In this case, I'm using Citadel Contrast. You can use acrylic inks as well if that's what you've got. Doesn't matter. Um, but these are naturally designed to go on transparent. So I'm just mixing a green color here, and you'll see I still need to thin the crap out of this. Even contrast paints that are designed to be running are still way too thick for this airbrush glazing process. We're looking for paint that's super, super transparent. You can also see there, I managed to fish something out. There had been a little contaminant in my paint. Okay, so now we're back to 40 PSI and we're just spraying in bursts from a distance here. Okay, so what this is doing, as you can see, each time this goes on, it starts to just calm down that aggressiveness 
of those layers. It helps blend them together, soften them off a bit, just make them look a bit sweeter, a bit nicer. Um, and this idea of airbrush glazing, basically you're just looking for an ink that's roughly the same color as your shadow, but because it's so thin, it just pulls everything back in a gradient towards your shadow instead of actually darkening things aggressively. So you, it allows you to be more aggressive when you're working up. It allows you to just kind of chuck it in there and then calm it back down with a glaze afterwards. So you can see now I'm actually just hair drying briefly here, uh, which is why I'm spinning the miniature a lot. And because I've used contrast paint, I don't need to mat it back off. If you used ink, you would. But you can see now it's just a lot more chill. Right, now we're getting into something silly. This is experimental. This is um, masking fluid. It's basically liquid latex, and it is actually designed for use with paper. So I didn't know whether this was gonna work, but I wanted to show it because, you know, experimentation is a lot of how we learn things, right? So the beauty of YouTube is while you're learning, I'm learning too, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. So I'll start out with this masking fluid, and I'm just trying to create a kind of rough shape of a flame. I was pretty aware that I was likely gonna have to tidy this up with a brush anyway. Um, so I wasn't going for like a beautiful, perfectly rendered flame shape. I just wanted something that, you know, looked kind of cool um, and would give me a good basis for a flame. And I think, you know, you can probably guess in your head what I'm planning to do here as, uh, as you see me put this on. But once I've got that, that flame shape painted in, I'm just lathering loads of mask around it now just to cover the shoulder pad completely. I'm then gonna grab a load of masking tape as well just to protect the rest of the miniature. And you're gonna see me, first I'm coming in with this bright yellow. It's the same bright yellow that I lightened the green with, um, just to lay down a foundation. And then you're gonna see me sl slowly start to make a gradient. Um, again, just with very, very gentle squirts and just moving down towards the bottom each time. Very, very straightforward. This is something that it will surprise you at how easy it is to actually do, doing a small controlled gradient like this. As long as you get that knack for just those really gentle finger presses, you'll be fine. And you can see now when I peel it off, it's an absolute fucking disaster. It looks awful. Um, so I came back in and now I'm, you're just going to see some footage now of me tidying it up and sorting it out. What would have actually been the best way to do this, that I realise in retrospect, is where I masked off the entire miniature. I should have just done that, masked everything else except the shoulder pad off then painted the entire shoulder pad as a gradient, and then just used black to carve the shape of the flames into that gradient, it would have been way quicker, way easier, and it would have actually meant that instead of sort of mixing airbrush and brush for, you know, a bit of a weird effect, I would have got a nice smooth gradient going over the whole thing. So, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? but it's a good learning experience and it's a good way to illustrate to you that experimenting with your airbrush is something that's really worth doing. We still get, as you can see, something nice out of it. And now I'm just gonna finish the rest of the miniature off camera and this is what you're gonna be left with. Um, I decided not to do any sort of edge highlights or brushed on highlights here because I wanted to keep the airbrush work as the focus. But you can see once the rest of the colors are on and you've got that context, these nice gradients over the panels look wicked. I ended up actually finishing this off, adding some edge highlights to it at the request of Twitter, and then I gave it away to a follower, um, and he, he's actually given it to his kids, so this is now the start of someone's army, which is super cool. Okay, so I appreciate that that was a lot of information. Hopefully with those visuals as well and me explaining what I'm doing, it wouldn't have been too difficult to digest. However, you know, if you've got any questions, that is what the comment section is for. Feel free to drop a comment below and I will do my best to get back to you and answer you. I normally answer anyone that asks a question, to be honest, so, you know, it's pretty reliable that I'm gonna be able to help you out. Now, of course, don't forget to like the video. Please do subscribe to the channel as well. It helps massively with visibility. I will be back later this week with something very, very tasty for you, but until then, have fun airbrushing, and I'll see you in the next one, folks.